Uh, welcome to, again to our Sunday worship gathering. Uh, my name is Jared. We're continuing to talk about the, the power and promises of God. If you belong to Jesus, if you are, are betting and building your life on him, then uh, you have access to God's power. And, and you can build and trust your life on, on all the good promises that he has for you and for his community and for his people. And on a Sunday like Pentecost Sunday, we, we celebrate that power of God that his Holy Spirit has come to dwell and live with us and guide us in, in all truth. And we're going to continue to talk about these uh, powers of God and the promises of God and, and the meaning they have in our lives today. And we're walking through uh, the letter to the Romans, and specifically we're looking at Romans chapter 8 where the author Paul is sharing with the, the, the early Christian church in Rome all of these unfolding powers and promises that they're clinging to in, in their life. We've been using this kind of as an illustration. This is a, a work of art by Andrei Rublev. Uh, it, it's a picture of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And, and as I've said previously so many times, the, the art historians, when they were cleaning this work, they saw this little rectangle down there in this open space and they believed that there was a, a mirror there originally when the artwork was first made so that people could come up to this work of art and see themselves seated at the table uh, with the Trinity, with, with God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And as we've talked about the, the power and promises of God and, and the message of Romans 8, we've said that the big overarching message is that if you belong to Jesus Christ, then he has done everything. There's no condemnation through his death and resurrection, through his, his love and his grace and goodness towards you. There's nothing keeping you from being in the presence of God and being at his table. And, and as we celebrate Pentecost, of, of having his Holy Spirit at work in your life. In fact, that's what you're made for. We're made to share in God's glory. We're made to participate in God's life. And the other big promise that we're really going to get into next week, and Pastor Steve will be talking about that, is uh, when you belong to Christ, there's nothing that can pull you away from his table. There's nothing in heaven and earth or all the power. There's no power in this creation that can pull you away from his table. So today we're going to continue talking about the, the promises of God. And, and we'll get into where we're going. We're going to be just in three verses today, Romans 8, 28 to 30. But before we dive in, I just want to, I want to raise this question and then try to answer it for you. Uh, why? Why are we giving ourselves to, to these verses today? Why are we looking at this stuff? Um, we can listen to all sorts of voices and podcasts and internets and TV, and, uh, and today's message isn't gonna be three ways to a better marriage or four ways to the most fit you've ever been. I'm not the right person to give that message. Um, or, or, you know, uh, how, to, how to have a better friendship or something like that. Now, sometimes the scriptures talk about that directly in the letters or, or how to, you know, three ways to ease your anxiety. And sometimes the Bible does talk directly about marriage or directly about friendship or directly about our anxieties or stresses and even a few times about how to be a little more physically healthy, actually. Um, but a lot of the time in these messages... Uh, in these letters that we look at, they're talking about the things of God, the, the, the way of God, the truths of God. So uh, not, we might come with our own questions and our own ideas and our own thoughts about, hey, God, help me with this or that in my life. But so often what the scriptures proclaim to us is the words that matter most, the big things in life, like here is who God is. Here's the truth about God. Here's God's love for you. Here's how God made you. The words we get and the words we're getting today are, are words that are meant to impact all of our life. So we might come today with one question or this question or this hope or this struggle in our life, but, but the words in these scriptures, the words in, in uh, the New Testament, in the Old Testament, and the words that we're gonna look at today specifically are words to help us live out all of life. They're, they're words to give us promises of God that can shape all that we do. So they're, they're good words, they're big words, they're powerful words. When the, when the early church first got this letter, they didn't, get, they didn't get a big book, right? They were early Christians trying to figure out how to live. Their lives had been, trans as they came to believe in Jesus, they, they, they had started to think differently and they started to act differently as they loved Jesus. And um, as they were probably kicked out of their homes and different cultures, you know, the, the Romans, the Jews, the slaves, the free, the male, the female, they were this new thing called Christians. And they were seeking how to live. And, and a letter like Romans came to them. 
And it didn't answer every question about what to do in this area or that area, but they, it gave them truth and the power of God that reshaped how they lived as their, their life just got flipped and turned upside down and, and they started to relive in a different and powerful way. So I, I invite you to lean in today. If you're a follower of Jesus, if you're betting and building your life on Jesus, then there are good promises for you today. Lean in, give yourself to this time to know more about the promises of God for your life to guide you as you, you live and as we live as a community. You might be here today and say, that's not me. I'm not committed to this yet. Okay, great. I'm glad you're here. You, you might be here because someone you love or a friend really wanted you to be here and they're, they're kind of dragging you here. If that's you today, I'm, I'm so glad that you're here. I, I want to say first and foremost, if you're here because someone invited you and you're not quite sure you want to be here, I, I want to say that that's a real act of love for you to decide to come here and be there for a friend or for a loved one. That's a Christ-like action. It's very hard to get me to do things that I don't want to do or don't feel like doing. So if that's you today, I want to say thank you for being here and, and to actually come to a place like this when you're not sure what you believe is a real, real act of, of love towards the person who invited you. Um, but I would say, lean in today. You're going to hear something good about the power and promises of God. And if you're here today and you're just flat out struggling and like, I know I'm supposed to go to church, but I'm not sure where I'm at with all of this, lean in. Be open to what God has to say today because I think these words are, are good words. These are words that have transformed, uh, given assurance, given blessing, given joy, given power to live through difficult times. This letter has inspired and moved people. God has revealed himself and shown himself in this letter to the Romans for generations and throughout different cultures. And I believe there's something good here today. All right, so we're gonna dive in. I have a handout. Usually I'm trying to give you a handout so you can take some notes. We're gonna be in Romans 8, verses 28 to 30. You can open up there. If I can find it myself, hold on, hold on. Here we go, all right, there we go. Romans 8, 28 to 30. Um, we're gonna be there. We're gonna do a few things. As we look through this passage, I'm gonna ask two questions, really two essential questions questions that I want all of us to know. Before you leave here, if someone says, what was this sermon about? I want you to be able to say, the pastor, the, the teacher, he wanted us to really wrestle and think about two questions. So we're going to look at two questions as we read this, these verses. We're going to see and hear about a series of promises of assurance for followers of Jesus, promises uh, uh, that God's got this, that God is faithful, that you can be secure in your faith. And then I'm gonna come back to those two questions and really hammer them home again. Because there's just two big questions I want us to all wrestle with today that, that matter a lot. All right, let's dive in. This is Romans chapter eight, verses 28 to 30. Uh, just to, to recap, Paul has been sharing with these followers of Jesus that there's no condemnation that they're in Christ. They have the, the blessing of God's spirit. They're called to be, uh, they're called this new life in Christ. They're going to suffer for following Christ. That's going to lead to glory. God's given the blessing of the Spirit as they, they seek God's glory, as they seek to, be, to live as followers of Jesus. They have this new status in Jesus. They're, they're God's children as they belong to Jesus. And uh, the world they're in is groaning and hurting. And, and Paul even says in verse 26 and 27, as we pray, we're going to be groaning as we seek to follow Jesus in the world and then these words of, of assurance come to these followers of Jesus. Verse 28 says, We know that all things work together for the good of those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. For those he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. So we're going to pause there. And I want to ask you two questions. First, I want to bring this up. Who are these words written to? These words are written to people who love God and who are being conformed to become like Jesus. These are promises. The promises we're going to look at, they are for people who love God and who are becoming like Jesus. 
And that doesn't mean that they're doing that to get saved or to get God to love them back. They have, they've claimed some promises. God has already acted in their lives. They've, they've come to learn that while they were still sinners, Jesus loved them and died for them and gave his life. They've come to believe that Jesus is the risen Lord and Savior. They've, they've come to know Jesus and believe it's this, this act of grace and God's revelation. And before they ever loved God, God loved them and gave himself for them. But they have responded to that good news and to proclaim that this Jesus is their Lord and Savior and the God they love. And as they love this God, they have committed to follow in the ways of God's son, Jesus, the Messiah. So they are a people who love God and who are becoming like Jesus. The two questions, I don't want you to leave here today without wrestling with them, without taking home. Do you love God? And are you becoming like Jesus? Do you love God and are you becoming like Jesus in your life? Not do you believe that Christianity is officially true and that you're happy that you have the right answer? Not uh, are you getting what you want from God? Is he making your life better or easier? Not are, are you confident that you have the right answer so that you get to go to heaven and you wanna make sure you don't go to hell? No, the, the answer that the, what Paul's talking to, he's talking to people who love God and who are becoming like Jesus. And these are uh, replicas of the words Jesus gave to his followers. Take up your cross and follow me. Lay down your life for me. Come, come be like me. Because this is who we're made to be, actually. Jesus talks about the greatest commandment, right? And this is all by God's grace and love that we can repent and turn to him. But we're made to love God, to be in fellowship with him, like, uh, like uh, what Manuela said uh, when Darren was talking and he said, you know, she called up and said, I love Jesus now, right? We're made to love God and then to grow in becoming like Jesus. If that's you, and you can look at your life and say, yeah, then I want you to hear these promises as real strong words of comfort and assurance and good words for you today to keep you going in this life as you struggle and as you strive to continue to love God in this world and continue to follow and be more like Jesus. If you're unsure, and, and let's, let's have honest moments, you know, and, and, and there's, as I think about my own life, you know, that, yeah, I love God, but yeah, sometimes I don't really love God, or yeah, I love Jesus and want to be like Jesus, but sometimes, I, you know, I don't want to be like Jesus in this area of my life or that area. Be open and honest about that. As we look at these promises, as we look at what God's doing in the lives of the the people in Rome and and in the lives of the church, uh, consider, consider what it means to make loving God and becoming more like Jesus the highest priority in your life. And and then you too embrace these promises. So let's continue. We have keep these two questions in mind. Do you love God? And, and the question you have to answer for yourself. And, and are you moving towards Jesus and becoming like him? And then hear these promises. Verse 30. So he said, verse 29, he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son so that he would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And verse 30, those he predestined, he also called And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. Four big, fun theological words here we're going to talk about for a little bit. But what is the promise here for those who love God and for those who are becoming like Jesus, those who are are called and conforming to his son? These are promises of assurance. The promise that you are predestined, and we'll say a little bit about what that means, that that you're called, that you're justified, that you will be glorified. Now, uh, when we hear these words, we often start thinking about first ourselves, and that makes sense, right? We we wanna know, like, does God have a destiny for me? Am I part of God's plan? Do I have a calling in my life? Am I I right with God? Am I set right with God? Will I I be glorified one day? Will I know God's glory, right? and, and that's what we go to. We think about ourselves, and that, that's fine. Um, when we hear this, when we hear words like being predestined, being justified, being glorified, the first thing we should do is think about Jesus. If Jesus is the firstborn, if we're called to be in Christ, if he's the firstborn and we're his many brothers and sisters in him, the one who first and foremost is predestined, 
The one who first and foremost is called. The one who first and foremost justifies. The one who first and foremost is glorified is Jesus, our brother. He is the one. So when we think about these terms and we think about these promises of God, we have to first see Christ because he is the one who goes ahead of us and we are in him. So if we as the church, if we're followers of Jesus and we're thinking about what does it mean to be predestined or what does it mean to be called? What does it mean to be justified? What does it mean to be glorified? All these big terms that can be confusing. We first and foremost have to look at Jesus because we are in him. Followers of Jesus participate in the life of Jesus. We take up our cross and follow him and his ways. So if we're going to understand how we're called, how we're justified, we have to look at first who he is and what he's done. I want to walk us through uh, Philippians chapter 2, and you can turn there and we'll have that up on the screen. Because uh, when, when we think about these terms, we have to think first and foremost about Jesus. And in Philippians 2, there's this poem or this song or this, what, what uh, people think are is like an early Christian creed that described in short terms who Jesus is and, and what he had done. And, and, and I think in these words, we see how he has been the one destined by God to accomplish something and how he's the one called by God and he's the one who justifies and he's the one who is, is glorified first. So in Philippians 2, Paul's talking to another church in Philippi and he says this, he says, adopt the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus or have the same mind as that of Christ Jesus. He's saying, be like Jesus. We're called to be like Jesus. So The promises are first in Jesus. So let's look at how God has used Jesus. And he says this, Jesus, who existing in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, is what it says in my translation, or uh, you could think of as grasping or attaining, right? He, he, He has this equality with God, but instead he emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant, taking on the likeness of humanity, And when he had come as a man, being humbled himself to become obedient to the point of death, even to death on a cross. So this is the work of Jesus, right? And if you've been in church, you've heard this. Jesus is eternal with God the Father. He comes down. He's Emmanuel. He's God with us. He becomes, he's he's the fullness of, of humanity. He empties himself and he dies on a cross. We know this truth if you've been, you've heard this, right? He was predestined to do this. This was his destiny. In that Pentecost story, and why we have the balloons up here today, uh, the Holy Spirit descends and comes upon people, and Peter, one of the first leaders of the church, gets up and he preaches, and he talks about Jesus. And here's what he says. He says, fellow Israelites, listen to these words. This Jesus of Nazareth was a man attested to you by God with miracles, wonders, and signs that God did among you through him just as you yourselves know. And then he says this in verse two, uh, chapter 223. Though he was delivered up according to God's determined plan and foreknowledge. Jesus had a destiny according to God's plan. God had a plan in Jesus to send him, to have him be delivered up and to go to the cross for the sake of this world. In Revelation 13, eight, it says, uh, the lamb of God who was slain from the foundations of the world. Jesus, this this is a good promise and good news, right? Jesus had a destiny. He was predestined. In in the mind of God, it was foreordained that Jesus would come and give himself for this world. That's his destiny. That's his calling, we see, too. In in Luke chapter 9, people are starting to wonder who Jesus is, and he asks his disciples, and people are saying, oh, you're a prophet, and oh, you're this or that. You're a great teacher. And he says, who do you say I am? And Peter, again, says, you're God's Messiah, And then he says, don't tell anybody this stuff yet. Then he says, it is necessary that the Son of Man suffer many things, be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and scribes, be killed, and be raised on the third day. This is before the cross. This is before resurrection. Jesus knows he has a calling. His calling 
is to go to the cross. His calling is to suffer and die on behalf of the world and then be vindicated and then be raised to new life and bring about this healing, this new creation, this redemption. And, and you see right after that, he says, he tells them, if anybody wants to follow after me, let him take up his cross daily and follow me. He's telling his followers, here's my calling. You're going to find the same calling in me. You're going, you too are gonna be called to take up that cross and follow me. Let's go back to Philippians 2. So he suffered death, even death on a cross. For this reason, God highly exalted him, gave him the name that is above every name. He dies, he suffers, he is raised. He justifies. He's, that word justification, it means, it's a legal term, it means set, it can set things right or declare righteous. Uh, this, this resurrection, this act of Jesus, it's a justifying act. Yes, it justifies us. It makes us right with God. It also sh shows and proves the faithfulness of God. God is going to be proven to be in the right. He's going to overcome the death, the, the hell, the evil, the sin in this world. He's going to be the faithful one that sets things right. Then he says this, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus is the one who will be glorified or who is glorified. So when we first think about these terms and these promises, we look to Jesus to understand them because he is the one that, that has done all of this for us. He is the one who was destined to die for us and for the sins of the world. He is the one who had the calling to give himself for you and for us and for all the world. He is the one who sets things right. He is the one who is glorified. And there's a glorious good news and promise is that we are in him. So in Jesus, we too have a destiny. We too are predestined. In Jesus, we too have a calling. In Jesus, we too can be set right and justified. In Jesus, we too will be glorified. Let's say a little bit about what each of those words means. So predestination. Who's heard the word predestination? Okay, a lot of you. Who's been in big conversations about predestination in their life and fights and arguments and some hands go way up? All right, so I want to say a few words. So when, when that word is used, and, and let's, let's talk about this here. This is a big theological term. And there are two enormously impactful thinkers, leaders, pastors, teachers, scholars in the, in the Christian history, in church history. St. Augustine, uh, the Bishop of Hippo, I believe, or North Africa. And, um, and then John Calvin is, is, is great reformed the, theologian uh, during the, the Protestant Reformation. Um, and they talk a lot about this idea of predestination. And usually when we talk about predestination, our thoughts go towards, did God predetermine who would believe in him and who would trust in him? And then did God predetermine or, or predecide who would not believe in him and who would reject him? And there's some scriptures that people go to to, to talk about this. And this is a question we have. And it's, it's not just a question in, in the Christian faith, Lots of other religions where there's belief in gods have these kind of questions of fate or free will. Um, you know, is your life determined by the stars or is your life predetermined by God or an oracle says this is what you're gonna do with your life. There's a great, you know, a huge work of uh, gr Greek literature, Oedipus Rex, you know, his fate is determined by an oracle when he's a child and he has to do this. Or do we have freedom? Do we have freedom to make choices? And there are some people that feel very strongly one way or the other on that topic when the word predestination is brought up. Um, and there are scriptures that people use to, to back up their thoughts, right? There are passages that, that really read like God has all of this determined, that, he, you know, that he'll harden some hearts and he opens up other hearts or he makes some objects for glory and some objects for destruction or um, you know, there's two brothers born, one I've loved, one I've hated, you know, some difficult language there. Um, and there's also scriptures that, that go the other way, like God so loved the whole world or God calls people to make choices or God's not willing that anybody would perish. So he's, he's holding out judgment, waiting for more people to make that choice. And there's lots of passages that, that seem to evoke that, that, that God's given us freedom 
to, to choose him or, or to, to walk away from him. So that's what's often in, in our head. I, I wanna say a few things. Here's what I think is in Paul's head when he uses this word. And I think this is, this is really important because we are thinking like theology, abstract theology, what does God know? And we're having kind of philosophical conversations. Paul is writing a pastoral letter to people who are living and following the faith. And this is, this is important because um, in our world, we trust the experts. And the experts are seen as like the best people in their fields. And we have this, and the, the academy are like the experts in our world, right? So when we think of theologians, we think, all right, they've parsed out all these mysteries and truths of God. We often think of them as they must be the best Christians because they know the stuff. They have this all organized. And that's not the right way to think about this. Theology, theologians, are always the second order work of the church. I'll say that again. Theology is always the second order work of the church that serves the main purpose, which is people following and loving God and living out this faith. And sometimes that gets mixed up in our world where we trust the academy, where we trust the, 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 the lab coats, for lack of a better term, the, the fancy clothes, right? They must be the expert, they're the best in their field. No, theology in, in the Christian faith serves the real work of the church, the people gathered together, participating in, in, in remembering communion, the people praying together, the people living out the faith. The theologians are there to help when people get out of line. Like when someone's got a really bad heresy, they're like, hey, hey, hold on, that's happened before, don't go down this path. You know, like when someone's like, hey, I really just, I love Jesus so much, he must be God, he really wasn't a human. The theologians are like, hey, we've had 2,000 years of living out this faith, you're, you're wrong, the theologians come in and, and help you out to correct when things get, get out of line. But they're always serving, living out this faith. So when Paul writes this letter, he's writing to people who are striving and struggling to love God and follow Jesus. He's not in an ivory tower contemplating philosophically what God's like and, and whether he's this way, he's this much predestination or he's this much free will or something like that. He's writing to uh, a Roman leader of a household who decided that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And now, all of a sudden, that man's businesses are falling apart because he's not going to the parties anymore. And people are wondering, hey, how come you're not at the party where we offer up the incense to Caesar? How come you're not at this, these drunken parties where we sleep with all sorts of different people? How come you're not participating in playing the Roman game anymore? How come you're acting anti Roman, how come you're not acting like a man anymore who leads and, and rules this way in Rome? And now this, this guy's following Jesus and he has all sorts of new beliefs that are out of step with his society. He's losing all sorts of business. He's not acting the way he's supposed to act. People are turning away from him. People are suspicious of him. He has wild new ideas and beliefs because he follows Jesus. One of his ideas now is that his body belongs to his wife and he's just committing to his wife only. That idea is bananas in Rome, and weird and strange, and now he's kind of this outcast. And he's wondering, God, I, I love you, I follow you, I I've come to believe in Jesus, is this part of the plan? And Paul's saying, yes. You, in Christ and his church, he has a destiny for you. He's predetermined that, that this way, you are part of his plan. This is a, a word of comfort and assurance to the, the Jewish man who was already part of a, a tolerated minority in Rome. And he comes to believe that Jesus is the Messiah and that makes him the minority within a minority. And he's, he's pushed out by his former Jewish brothers and sisters who now are, are angry at him and, and hate the beliefs he has. And now his family's mad at him and, and now he has to join these new Roman Christians and he's, he's in this whole new family and he comes to find this joy and love and peace in Jesus. But he's... At times he feels like a man without a home and he's suffering and struggling and, and trying to get through life. And he's like, God, is this part of the plan? He says, yeah, you're part of my body. You're part, of, you're part of Christ. God's had this plan all along. You're part of it. God's working out his purposes and his plan. This is part of your destiny. Hang in there. I love you. Or there's a, a slave woman who found this new freedom and joy in Christ, but her life is still an absolute mess and a disaster. 
And she has very little autonomy on what she does with her life. And she's struggling and she's suffering and she loves Jesus and she loves that, that, that she's called a child of God. And she's teaching her own children about this new faith and, and this, this wonderful, uh, this Jesus who can change her kids' lives. And then one day her kids are taken and sold and they're put on a ship to North Africa and she's never gonna see them again. And, and she's wondering and crying out what happens to her own kids as, as she knows Jesus and his love and his goodness. And she's wondering, God, is this part of the plan? God, help me, God, I need you. And Paul's word is, yes, if you're in Christ, you are predestined, you're part of his church. God has always had this plan for this church that's going to be a light and a witness and suffer in this world. So when we hear that word, I want us to hear it as a word of comfort and assurance to those struggling to follow Jesus in the midst of a difficult world. This word calling, we have this promise of assurance that we are called and we look back to our baptism and our salvation and say, yes, we are called. In Christ, we have a calling like him. He was called, we see his witness. He goes through the baptism waters and then he's called on a mission. If you belong to Jesus Christ, you can claim the promise that you are called and you're called to participate in his life. And that life uh, leads to suffering and glory, as, as we see in Christ, it leads to the cross and resurrection. And then Paul gives this promise that he who he called, he also justified. If you belong to Christ, you can claim that promise that you have been set right with God. There's nothing keeping you from that table. There's nothing keeping you from that fellowship, that you are, are set right. You can also claim the promise that you will be vindicated one day. As these Roman Christians were struggling with following Jesus and wrestling with a world that was against them, and as we too today seek to love and be a light and witness to Jesus, people will question who we are. People will question how we act, question our motives. We can know that one day we will be vindicated. One day if we stay in the ways of God, if we stay in the love of God, if we love God and conform to Jesus, we're going to act in ways that are different from the world, and we're going to look strange and weird and get pushed back. And we might think, I gotta prove myself. I gotta prove that I'm right about all this stuff. No, we're called to be a witness. We're called to suffer and love others and show others Christ by how we live like Jesus. And we can know that we'll be, we'll be vindicated one day. One day when the new heavens and new earth come, we will, we will be shown to be in the right. Not because we're so good or perfect, but, but because we are, are committed to Christ in his way. And when we belong to Christ and when we, we are, are those who love God and who are conforming to the way of Christ, we too can claim the promise that we will be glorified, that those he is justified, those he's set right now, will one day be glorified. And we know through Romans 8, if you've been tracking with us the last few weeks, as we suffer with him, we can claim the promise that we will be glorified with him. These are promises of assurance for those who are striving and struggling to keep the faith in difficult times. As you're seeking Jesus, um, and, and if you're not sure if you love God or belong to God, I, I want you to know how glorious and good these promises are. They are promises of assurance in difficult times that, that when we stick with him. In verse 28, that, that last promise, right, is uh, he says he'll work all things for good for those who love him who are called according to his purposes. It's kind of the this, this summary of all of these promises of assurance. That if you belong to Jesus, you can know he is working this all out for good. It might not look like that now, as there's wars and as there's rumors of wars and as things in your life are falling apart and friendships are falling apart and relationships are falling apart and, and you're hurting and you're suffering and you're crying out and you're groaning, God, why is it like this way? I want it to be different. We get promises of assurance. He is working it all out. He is using us, his church, to work all things out. We are participating in his mission now and that mission is going to involve suffering and glory. But he is working it all out out for the good, and we can rejoice in that. I want to come back to those two questions. Do you love God? And are you becoming like Jesus? I think that is our destiny in Christ. And we come to know him and trust him. So I want you to, uh, my ask this week is that you would take those two questions and wrestle with them yourselves and maybe dig a little deeper. Maybe ask yourself some sub-questions, right? Um, where am I showing that I love God? 
That's something we should rejoice in as a church body, as, as we are loving God, as we sing praises to God. Take some time this week. You have that handout to write these questions down. And the ask every week is that you would take a few minutes each day and, and think about the promises of God. Take some time this week. Talk about this in your groups this week, right? Where do I love God? If there's areas of your life that you are growing and showing your love for God, celebrate that, rejoice in that, rejoice with your brothers and sisters. Ask that tough question of where am I not loving God? I think for each of us, there's areas where like, yeah, I'm really coming to love God, but there's areas where I, I, I don't wanna love God in that area of my life, right? Or same question with Jesus. Where, where am I becoming more like Jesus? I, I see, I see people in this community growing in Christ and becoming more like Jesus. Take some time to think about that and celebrate maybe where you used to be and where you are and, and celebrate and rejoice and say, God, I, I am coming to be more like you and, I, and I'm so thankful for that. And then think, where do I not want to be like Jesus? Does anyone have an area of their life where they know they're supposed to want to be more like Jesus, but, but they don't want to be more like Jesus? Own that. Be honest about that. Think about that. Pray through that. I remember when I was a kid, I, I loved the idea of Jesus, but I thought becoming like Jesus would be so boring, and I feel like I'd lose myself and the cool stuff I wanted to do, and that's changed a lot over time, right? But think about Think about what, what fears we have that keep us from really loving God and from becoming more like Jesus. I'd like you to, to, to dream with me or consider with me just for a few more moments and then we'll, we'll go to, to God and worship. Um, what would it look like for us, for us, this body here in Red Bank, this community, to have as, as our highest priorities loving God and becoming like Jesus? What if our mind was like that? What if our hearts became like that? That in response to God's great love, in response to the calling Jesus fulfilled, in, in response to his emptying himself and loving us and dying for us and loving and giving himself for us and being the risen Lord, in response to the gift and giving of his spirit to empower us to love him and to be more like him, we set in our hearts and minds together as a body seeing as highest priorities love for God and, and becoming more like Jesus in our lives. What would happen? One thing that would be amazing, these promises of assurance and predestination and, and, and justification and glorification, these wouldn't be abstract things we talk about and have philosophical debates. These would be promises in our hearts that fill us with life and joy and comfort and peace in the midst of difficulties. These would be lived promises, not abstract ideas. The second thing I, I can guarantee if we set as our highest priority loving God and becoming like Jesus is we will experience more suffering like Jesus and we will experience more of the glory of Jesus. We, it will experience more suffering. One of the reasons it's hard to want to love God or to be more like Jesus is you will experience more suffering like Jesus if you commit to doing that, which is what Paul says, which is what Jesus says, which is what is clear throughout the scriptures. You will bump up against a world that does not love Jesus. Um, C.S. Lewis, I'm, not, I'm butchering the quote, but he said, if you wanted to pick a religion that made life simpler, I don't recommend Christianity. It will not make your life easier. It will make your life in, in the, it will make, it will lead you to glory and you will find a peace and a hope and a joy and a love you'll never known, and you will be stretched and moved and suffer as you seek to love others the way Christ has loved you. That's just the truth. Um, imagine the witness we would have to a world that we love. Um, I, I, was, I was at a, a, a funeral, and I feel like I've told this story to eight or nine of you already. I was at a funeral a little over a week ago for a woman that some of you know, uh, Sandy, Sandy Bova. Um, she was a... Uh, uh, she is, she is alive and in Christ and in glory with Christ. Um, uh, she had been a, has been a pastor's wife of, of Jim Bova, who's been a pastor in this area for 40 years or so. And uh, they're a part of a church called Searchlight Church. And I love the tagline of their church and I'm gonna mess it up a little bit, but it was something, it's something along the lines of um, living and loving like Jesus. It's something along the lines of becoming like Jesus and loving others uh, like Jesus loved, um, loved, loves us, right? Um, what, what struck me as, as so powerful, she is somebody who, it was clear, she lived her life uh, in response to finding about, about God's love. She lived her life as someone who clearly loved God and then clearly as someone who was becoming more like Jesus and that showed in her witness. And uh, about 
25 people got up, and not all of them talked, but three families got up and shared about her witness to them and, and their life. And, and one group that got up were, were brothers and sisters in the church that she had committed to in the church long term with. And you heard that profound witness she had as she became like Christ, the witness she had to other brothers and sisters in Christ. That's one thing that would happen if we loved God and became like Christ. And I see that happening all over the place in, in, in our church and, and maybe you have throughout the years. But we'll have such a profound impact in loving and caring for our other brothers and sisters in Christ when we make loving God and, and being like Christ our highest priority. They also had a, a, a group come up that it was clear that they were close to Sandy but I don't think quite shared the faith that she had. And they still spoke of her, about her powerful love, that she embodied the love of Christ to them. And that's true too. As we make loving God our highest priority and, and becoming like Jesus our highest priority, we can have such a profound impact on people who we love that don't know Jesus. And then last, uh, her, her family, her sons and her grandchildren got up and shared. And you saw how the way she embodied the way of Christ has such a profound and powerful impact on multiple generations that descended from her. And I was just so jealous um, of, of how well she lived her life. And it was clear she loved God. And as she became like Jesus, that led to a powerful witness to one another in a church body that built each other up, to unbelievers that, that, that she loved and wanted to know Jesus. They saw Christ in her. And then to her family, how she embodied the love of Christ and the impact that had. Um, imagine the multiplying impact if we, we all may loving God our highest priority and becoming like Jesus one of our highest priorities. We would have a transformative impact on one another in the church as we loved and built each other up and comforted one another. We would have a, a, a more profound and powerful impact to those around us who don't yet know Christ's love and, and be impactful in really good and, and blessed ways. And we would be a, a blessing that, that pours the love of God in the way of Christ into our children and grandchildren and family around us. Imagine a community that did that. It becomes a multiplying movement. Uh, the story of Pentecost is a people that experience the power of the Holy Spirit and then they have all things in common and they start making love for God and being a witness and living the way of Jesus their highest priority. And that cluster spreads out and out and out and impacts. And um, we're called to do that today in Red Bank, to be people that make God the highest priority, make loving like Jesus the highest priority and, and seeing how that impacts us together as we follow Christ, how it's a blessing and a light to those who need to know about the love of Jesus and how we can have a, a generational impact on pouring the love of Christ into our own families. I'm gonna pray for us and then we're gonna continue in worship. And, and as we continue in worship, uh, there is space up front for prayer. Um, Pastor Russ will be up here, Alan Eloise will be up here. And um, if you would like to respond in any way or if you need prayer for anything, you are welcome to just come forward, have a time of prayer while we worship together um, or pray where you are. Uh, but there are, we are people that are available to pray with you, to help you, to support you, to, to pray words of comfort and healing and, and whatever you need prayer for today. If you wanna know more about the love of God or what it means to know him and follow him, we'd love to pray with you about that and talk to you about that and share about the saving grace and goodness of Jesus so you can respond in love for him. Do you pray with me? Lord, we thank you first that you have loved us. Lord, by the power of your spirit, open us up to your love. Show yourself to us, reveal yourself to us so that we might experience your love, that we might know the power of your cross and resurrection, and that we might respond and turn to you and love you and live in your ways. I thank you for your servant, Paul, for the early church in Rome, this letter that still speaks today. I thank you for the promises of, of assurance that you have a plan and in Christ we get to be a part of it. The promise that we have a calling in you to participate in your ways and that you've called us out of darkness into light. The promise that, that you have set things right and we can be justified and set right with God and, that, um, and the promise of, of glory that you are the glorious one, that you are reigning, that you will return and your reign will fill all of creation again. And we can be caught up and belong and participate in that. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your saving grace, your love. And on this Sunday, we thank you for the gift and power of your spirit in our lives. Holy Spirit, empower us to love God 
work through our groans, draw us closer to you, draw us nearer to you, Lord Jesus, so that we might live like you and conform to you and your ways and find your goodness in you. Bless and keep those in this room. Be with us now as we go to you in worship. Continue to speak to us, Lord. It's in your name we pray. Amen.